but still don't know how to say it. Oh. Okay, so <coughs> thank you for the introduction, Dr. Bell. So today I'd like to tell you a little bit about this field uh, that we call liquid cell electron microscopy. And in particular, I'd like to tell you the work that we've done over the last few years using the NanoQuarian, a home-built device here, where we were doing some radiation and electrochemistry. But first, I'd like to start, as we should start all things in science, by thanking those who make it possible for us to be here. And scientifically, I really need to thank, uh, first of all, Joe Grogan. He was the PhD student that came before me, and he's the one who really paid a lot of the scientific debt allowing this work to happen. He was a great guy that I got to work with for a number of years, and he basically created this device, handed it off to me right when it started working perfectly. And that's really the science that we're going to see today. Frances Ross, she's here in the room with us. She's our collaborator from IBM TJ Watson. She's really one of the pioneers in this field, and I've been able to work with her for the last few years, and she's really been a second advisor for me, and it's been a great experience. My advisor, Dr. Heim Bao, he's the one who makes sure that I keep things new and exciting on a daily basis and he's been very gracious to me through the last few years. All this work that I'm showing you is, is very complicated, and it takes many hands, actually, to get these experiments to work, to get these analyses to work, and so we have many collaborators at a number of institutions, but in particular, I'd like to thank Michael Norton, who's a Penn student here, and Jung Hung Park, who's a UCLA postdoc. They're the ones who really sit down with the microscope with me and are in the trenches, turning the knobs and levers to get this work to proceed. Naturally, we need to thank our funding sources. The work here has been funded by the National Science Foundation. So let me ask you a question. If you were to take something like water and put it in outer space, what do you think would happen? Do you think the water would stay there as a liquid? No, it would just evaporate off. So now when you want to do, say you want to image a process, say gold nanoparticles aggregating in water, you might want it to go to a system such as an electron microscope, which can really give you atomic resolution and in order to see what the dynamics are of these particles. But an electron microscope operates at a high vacuum, kind of like outer space. So if you were to take your solution of gold particles and put them on an electron microscope grid and you expose it to the vacuum, instead of seeing particles move around, all you would see is the water evaporate and you'd have a dried out sample. So this is, it becomes very difficult to image dynamical systems in motion in the electron microscope. And what people have traditionally done is you can take these samples and you can either dry them out or freeze them very quickly in order to take pictures of the system as it evolves at separate time steps. This would be kind of like going to a horse race with a regular camera and taking pictures of many horses as they go by as a way to understand the gallop. You can get a lot of information that way and you can learn a lot about what is happening. However, it would be better if you could bring a video camera into that system. And that's what we want to do with our science today with the nanoscale resolution of the electron microscope. So, in the bottom, um, and why would we want to do this? There are many processes that happen at the nanoscale that are very interesting in liquid systems, especially high, uh, high vapor pressure liquids such as water. Say the assembly of gold of particles, nanoparticles, uh, as I mentioned, or in the top right here we can see the, the nucleation and growth of a gold nano prism. And these processes are important because if we can understand how they are happening in real time, then we can control their geometry, which can control their uh, eventual material properties. And there are other systems that are important, such as biology. And in the bottom right here, I'm showing you a flip book, actually, of one of those, uh, of a biological system, where people imaged frozen actin and myosin. These are the proteins that work in your muscles in order to allow you to have your muscles contract. Actin is this long filament, and myosin is this molecular motor that walks hand over hand on these filaments. So what they did is they took many different pictures and made a flip book, but they weren't able to actually image one. So this is, every picture is a separate uh, muscle motor, and it isn't just one going through its transition, so there might have been some key steps that were missing. So this is really what we want to see in these processes. Another really interesting reason to do work is when a Nobel Prize winner tells you it's virtually impossible, and I'm just going to read this from P.G. Degens, who was a Nobel Prize winner for his work in liquid crystals, and he says, in spite of their importance, these processes are still poorly understood. The solid liquid interfaces are much harder to probe than their solid vacuum counterparts. And here's the important part. Essentially, all experiments making use of electron beams become inapplicable when a fluid is present. Well, today, I'm going to show you that we overcame this limitation. So, how did we do it? We used the NanoQuarium, which is a home-brewed device by Grogan and Bao here at Penn. And this is basically two TEM grids that we are able to seal together using direct wafer bonding in order to create a completely hermetic seal, so we have a device that is completely airtight. And what this does is it allows us to put our airtight device that has basically room temperature and pressure liquid in it and isolate it from the high vacuum of the electron microscope. 
We make these devices with standard lithography practices, so we're able to do this on a wafer level, so we can make many of them at the same time. But we can also do things such as incorporate electrodes so that we can do the electrochemical experiments that we will show in a bit. And we have extreme control over this because we're using standard MEMS processing. So again, just to kind of illustrate what is happening, we can have one TEM grid where we have a very thin electron transparent window supported by the silicon wafer. We can take a second one of those, separate them by a small spacer, in this case a silicon oxide. We seal them hermetically, which allows us to have a system. Now when we have, those, say, those gold nanoparticles floating around, we can have that system that when we put in the electron microscope, we can actually get the nanometer resolution of the electron microscope and watch them moving dynamically rather than looking at a static dried out sample. And we can exploit this for um, imaging these different processes that we, say, that we believe are important. So we had a new toy. What's the first thing you do? You go and play with it. So we took five nanometer gold particles. This was done by uh, Grogan. And they took, we took five nanometer gold particles, introduced them into our device. And we were very happy to see that when we looked at them on the electron beam that they were aggregating. And we can look at this. And the aggregation of spherical particles is something that's well understood because you can study it with other techniques rather than direct imaging, uh, such as light scattering. And we were able to analyze these videos and compare it to the classical literature on diffusion-limited aggregation in order to find out that all the different measures of these systems uh, showed that it was consistent with diffusion-limited aggregation. We didn't know why they were aggregating, because they should be shelf-stable particles, but we were happy to see that even though we have a very thin liquid layer, we are actually able to see physics happening that agrees with what we should see. So we'll come back to that question of why they're aggregating later. So we have a device that works. Let's go look at something a little bit more interesting that nobody else has been able to look at before. We'll come back to the aggregation. So the system we wanted to look at is copper electro deposition. I'll explain the, the video here. On the side here is the edge of our silicon wafer. In the bottom left, where it's the brightest, that's just where we have our solution and two silicon nitride membrane windows. At the top, we have a platinum electrode that has been deposited and patterned. And what we're doing here is we're applying some current. All the experiments I showed today will be galvanostatic, meaning we're applying constant current. And that's so we can keep track of the mass, because if we know how many electrons we put into the system, we know how many copper ions we deposit. And what we can do is what we see is the evolution of the interface as this, this copper grows. The reason we look at copper is copper is something that is well understood. IBM kind of pioneered using copper to grow interconnects in uh, transistors for computers. So if uh, the, all of the transistors that you make in your wafer, they need to be able to communicate electrically. And copper is something that is well suited for doing that. So is copper something that's been studied. So when we look at what we see here, we can compare it to what we know about copper. Uh, because it is a very complicated system. And we can make sure that our device is acting appropriately and that we're really seeing the physics rather than an artifact of our device. To kind of give you an overall view of what's going on, the area that we're imaging is a very small portion of a very a relatively large electrode. We're looking at this small little box here, which is the size of this window is about 2 microns. Uh, to give you reference, the whole optical window that we have, this is the two silicon nitride uh, windows here, is 100 microns, so that's about the thickness of a hair. And we're imaging this very small portion of it. And um, it's just along the electrode. So we're really getting localized measurements of what is going on in these systems when we use our device. So what can we do? First thing we do is we, again, we're using galvanostatic deposition. We can also measure the potential. So when you're doing electrochemistry, you can really measure two things. You can measure the current and the voltage. We're controlling the current. Uh, so the voltage is an output. And what we see here on the left is the is nuclear growth. So we apply a relatively low current density to our device. And what we see is islands forming of copper. And this is consistent with what is known in, uh, known in the literature. And right here we're cycling. So we're doing a deposition current for some time. And then we're doing an etching current. So we can see that we get very nice cycling of these, uh, these structures where we can deposit them and then strip them pretty efficiently. So this shows us that our, our device is working pretty well and that our platinum electrodes are a good electrode for depositing copper. So since we applied a low current, uh, now we want to move up and apply a higher current to see if we can go through the different phases of what we expect to happen during electrodeposition. So if we increase our, our current density, then what we see is instead of having nuclear growth, now we have all the, what happens now is we have a higher current density, so there's a higher potential, which makes more of those islands growing all at once, so it grows more like a film, a compact film, rather than uh, individual nuclei. And here we can see that we get a nice film on top of the electrode. And this is the, these are the properties that you want. Say you're manufacturing a device, you probably want a nice smooth electrode that is grown if you're using this for manufacturing of devices. 
And so this is the, the regime that we want to be in. Uh, one thing that we can relate this type of data to is, say, battery charging. When you charge a battery, you take, just like we're doing here, you take ions out of solution, and you convert them into a solid. And so what, and by understanding this, we can actually do better with our battery charging uh, using this data. So you might, you know when you're using your phone or your, any of your devices that it takes a long time to charge the battery. And so we, we want to come up with ways to, say, charge it faster. So I'll use this just as an example of what this, this science can tell us. So you might imagine, okay, we know that if you put current into the battery, you charge it, and it takes some time. So if we put in a higher current, it will charge faster, right? Well, actually, we can end up causing damage by doing that. So here's a higher current density, and we end up getting these ramified growth structures, these almost dendrites that occur. And so if you're talking about, say, the charging of battery or making of a device, you won't want, necessarily want this type of structure because it could damage your cell. Uh, what's really interesting about dendrites is that you can see that after when they etch, some of the parts get left behind. So this, if this is a battery situation, if you're leaving material behind that's no longer electrically connected to your electrode, then you're losing charge in your battery. And that's why, say, your laptop doesn't hold as much charge over time as when it first did. Uh, the other thing that's very dangerous about these dendrites is you can see that they grow very fast, and there's a lot of space in between. So if you're trying to maximize the amount of charge you can store per unit volume, you're going to keep your two electrodes as close together as possible, and you really want to just fill up all that space so you don't have extra material there. And what do you think could happen if you have these very large ramified disparities? These dendrites can, or the ramified growth, can bridge between the two electrodes, and if when you were a kid you ever took a wire and put it on two ports of a battery, what happened to that wire? It got very hot, right? And so this could be a big problem for batteries because then they're going to end up, you can end up destroying the battery. This was one of the issues that they thought was happening with the Boeing Dreamliner a couple of years ago with their lithium ion batteries catching on fire. So you really want to be able, we really need to be able to understand how we approach this uh, diffusion limited regime where we get these very large asperities. And so if we can understand this physics, then we can do a better job of controlling whether it's a manufacturing process or if it's in a battery charging process. So, so far I've shown you a lot of very uh, interesting qualitative images. We need to, if we really want to understand the physics, we need to be able to quantify this. So we developed an unsupervised, non-parametric image processing algorithm that goes through and basically it just automatically goes through uh, all of our images and it grabs the interface edge at every, and during every frame. And so we do some very basic processing where we, we take our image, we rotate it just so that it makes the, the numerics a little bit easier so that our growth direction is perpendicular to electrode. That just makes my life easier later. Uh, we can filter out the noise. Uh, because we know that the beam can cause damage to the sample, which I'll talk more about later, uh, we always operate at the minimum dose or close to the minimum dose so that we just get a visible image, but we have the minimum amount of beam. So this means our images will be very noisy. You can see there's a lot of static in the background. So we filter out some of the noise and then we use a uh, binarization process in order to extract the edge. And we're able to very, very readily extract the, the growth edge uh, in a 2D fashion, a 2D projection of the growth edge as a function of time. You can see here, even with these very large disparities and some variations in the intensity of the copper, that we do a very good job of getting the, uh, the edge that we see with our eye. So now we have a quantitative measure of what's happened during this electrodeposition. And so we can look at, say, we look at a very long time of a low current density. So this is some time when we never reach these, the regime where we get this diffusion-limited growth. Uh, we can look at what's happening, say, with the, the maximum, minimum, and average height as a function of time. And the, uh, this is off by a factor of time, I apologize. But we can look at this growth edge, and we can see that for galvanostatic deposition, the average growth height grows almost at a constant. <coughs> really what we're doing here is we're depositing for 10 seconds, then taking 10 seconds off, so it's actually pulsing but we're very far away from the diffusion limited regime. But we need a long time deposition of a relatively smooth surface that eventually has a little bit of structure to it. Um, but we'll, uh, we'll talk about that right at the moment. Uh, so this is kind of a, a first order measure of what is happening, the maximum, minimum height, and then the average height. We can begin to use some other measures of what's going on in order to quantify what the roughness of the surface is or how wavy the surface is. And we use the RMS roughness as a measure and we plot the RMS roughness on the right here. And we can see that there are two regimes. The, um, the first regime where we're growing at an exponent of 0.3. So we're saying that the amplitude is growing as time to some constant. And the higher this constant means the faster that the amplitude is growing. This 0.3 is important uh, when we compare it to uh, other types of numbers that we can get. 
So we can imagine a world where we have completely random deposition. You can think of this as a Connect 4 board where you randomly choose a column and drop a, one of the chips down it. If you were to measure the RMS roughness as a function of time of that system, you'd get a 0.5. If you were to compare this to um, a system where, say, you have just two columns now and you always drop it down one column, so you have the maximum growth in the amplitude of your roughness, then your exponent would be 1. So basically, what that means is any exponent below 0.5 you have some, sur some sort of force that is smoothing out your surface, uh, and anything above 0.5 means you are preferentially depositing at the, the tips of the growth. So in this case, where we have this low current density deposition, and we get this growth exponent of 0.3 at, in the initial roughening phase, then uh, what we're saying is that we're giving surface diffusion a chance to smooth out the surface as we go, and we won't reach that diffusion-limited growth regime. And this exponent of zero at the end is just a... Um, kind of a consequence of the length scale of which we are looking at this roughness, uh, where the roughness saturates for a given time, given how much of the surface we're looking at. Uh, that's something I can go in more detail if people have questions. So now let's move to a more exciting case. Say, let's look what happens when we actually get these large ramified growths. So here we can look at a high current density deposition, where we can again measure the maximum, minimum, and average height. We see that there's an initial short time here that's less than a second. This is associated with the fact that our, our electrode is actually uh, thinner than the liquid. So initially, the copper has to grow on top of the electrode, and that takes about a second before it grows out in a 2D fashion. So once we reach about one second, then it's going to be growing more in a 2D fashion, which is in line with our image processing. So this, this flat part in the initial phase is an artifact of the fact that our growth is initially 3D before it becomes 2D. And what we see here is that there is some time in between that looks similar to that low current density deposition where the maximum height, minimum height, and average height all grow together. Um, but at some point, it's really interesting that the minimum height goes flat while the maximum height start, begins to grow at a faster rate. It's, does, it's not exponentially faster. It's just fast enough to keep the average growth rate um, at a constant. Uh, so what's happening here is what is known as the transition to diffusion-limited growth. So you can imagine that as the surface is growing, the way that it grows is it takes ions out of solution. So initially, we have many ions very close to us. We kind of like if you had a desk covered with candy, uh, you could begin to take the ones that are close to you very quickly, and it doesn't matter uh, how fast you grab them because there's enough that's near you. Once you deplete the ones that are near you, however, you have to take time to reach and grab them. And so the force that, of that reaching and grabbing in this case is diffusion. So it takes uh, time for the ions far out in solution to diffuse to the surface. And what this means is that you can locally deplete the solution. And, that, um, and when you locally deplete the solution, the ions will begin to follow the path of least resistance or the highest conductivity. So that means they will always go to, toward the peaks that are furthest into solution, meaning the troughs, the values of these growths, will end up uh, going to zero surface excess concentration before the tips. So the tips will be able to continue to grow, but the values will never be able to grow because all of the incoming ions are being stolen by the, the peaks growing into solution. You might notice that eventually in our window, the whole growth goes to a zero, the average height stops growing. And so what this means is at that point, since these uh, dendrites are actually a fractal uh, structure, that if we were to zoom out and see more of the electrode, we see that some other peak outside the window is growing faster than these. So the whole window eventually becomes the, the trough in our experiment. So it, the whole area is, is, uh, it has no incoming ions to deposit, and that's why the growth stops. More interesting than that, when we look at the RMS roughness, so again, to measure the amplitude of the roughness and its time, in this early stage, up until about this is three seconds, where we see the trough going flat, we end up getting this growth exponent of 0.3, meaning in this very initial stage, when there's still many ions near the surface, that we end up growing at a rate where the surface diffusion still has time to smooth out the surface. However, once the valley stops growing, then our exponent jumps up to 0.8. Remembering those bounds that I told you before, that means that the, now the amplitude is growing very quickly, and this is really where we're in the ramified growth experiment. So the time between when we see the valley stop and when the RMS roughness takes off, they correlate very well at about three seconds in this particular case. So this is something that we can begin to study more and begin to understand.
We can go even further. So I told you that the maximum and minimum height are kind of the first order measure with our quantitative data. Um, so we can actually go a little bit further and do the calculus of moving surfaces, where we know where the edge is at every time. So we can actually figure out what the normal velocity is, so how fast any point along the surface is growing at a function of time. And the reason this is important is because it's directly related to how much mass is coming in. So the velocity is directly related to how much copper we deposit. And how much copper we deposit, you can actually count the number of of electrons that have gone there. So basically, by measuring the speed, we have a direct measure, or estimate rather, of what the, the local current density is. And for, uh, this is important for electrochemists because this is how you measure the what is happening in the system. And so on the left here, I show what we've been calling heat maps of this particular ramified growth experiment where we show the velocity or the normal speed as a function of time, where the lighter the color, the faster it is going. So initially it starts out pretty uniform, and then eventually we can see that this green line re represents that transition time uh, when the valley, this valley in particular, stops growing. And we can see that some areas grow very fast while others end up stopping. And so this shows us that what is expected uh, with diffusion-limited growth is actually happening at the, the nanoscale as we would expect. We can go a little bit further and we can begin to take some measures of this. So uh, if we take the local current density at any point and divide it by the average current density and plot it as a function of the mean deviation from the height, so how far we are away from the average height of the interface as it's growing in time, uh, we can plot the, that data here and compare it to what we'd expect for this measure of a sine wave. So you can analytically solve for the sine wave um, and other people have done that. And the black line is the analytical solution for a sine wave, which shows that the farther away you are from the average height, so either the farther you are into solution, if you go towards the right, or the farther you are towards the initial electrode, uh, that you have a variation in the current density, where the pieces farthest out should be the fastest moving. Uh, we can see from the data there is a lot of scatter in it, but the, the black points represent early times, and the red points represent just before, uh, or just after, rather, the onset. So we can see that after we've reached the diffusion limited regime, we go from being very well clustered in the center, where there's not much variation, as we can qualitatively see over here, uh, there's not much variation to where we have large variations in the current densities or velocities. Uh, so this, this, and it goes in a, it scales in a way that is similar to that of a sine wave. So this makes sense. So really what we can say now is that the peaks are going faster because they're further in solution, they have more access to ions, and the valleys are slowing down because they are being deprived of the incoming ions. Another way we can, a more simple way to put this is uh, we can look at what is the, the mass inequality of the deposit. So if we look at the top 25% of mass earners in this case, uh, so the top 25% of fastest growing points, and asks how much of the total incoming mass do they uh, receive, uh, we can see in the, dendri uh, in the ramified growth case compared to the low current density case that they both start off at about 30%, so Mother Nature initially is pretty, uh, pretty equitable. But in the case where we do reach a diffusion limited regime, this takes off and by the end of this growth, before it stops slowing down, we're end up about 60 to 70 percent where most of the mass coming in is going to the top 25 percent of points. On the other hand, when we do a low current density and we never fully deplete the local solution, we end up staying at about that 30 percent for the whole time, even for a very long deposition. Uh, so this really is just another way of restating what the current density is telling us in a, a nice simpler metric. All right, so now, now we've seen a couple of things. We understand a little bit of how these ramified growth uh, asperities occur, how we can go from this roughening regime where we have a surface that is becoming wavy, um, but it's not, be, it's not fully ramified growth. Uh, can, we do any, can we exploit what we've learned in order to have a better control of the morphology? <coughs> so initially when I showed you that uh, the case where we do have that ramified growth, there's that initial three seconds in that particular experiment where we weren't uh, growing too fast. So what we did here is we started depositing at the same uh, total applied current. Uh, we deposit for one second and then wait five seconds. So what this does is it allows those ions to have time to diffuse. So we give the candy more time to be pushed towards us uh, as we're depositing. And we can see that this pulsing over a very short amount of time is able to grow a very large amount of copper. The length scale is still the same. And if we look at the RMS roughness as a function of time and then take an average RMS roughness, we see that it's 0.5. So this is directly akin to a perfectly random deposition process or a Poisson process. 
meaning we're not preferentially depositing at the, the peaks or uh, smoothing the surface too much. The benefit here is that in 48 seconds, including the total off time, we're able to deposit as much as we did at the low current density case in 350 seconds. So this is a much faster way of doing this. Uh, pulse plating is what this is called. It's a, actually a standard process. And one thing that a lot of people like to do is reverse pulse plating. So here we're just depositing and waiting. You can deposit and then etch in order to try and smooth out your surface is another process. But we learned something very important when we're doing that. So we can do reverse pulse plating and get similar nice surfaces. But if you do the reverse etching a little bit too much, you can end up getting some very interesting structure. So here we're doing a little bit of deposit and then we're doing an etch. And since we etch too much, because we, when you do the reverse process, the, again, the ions will leave the places where it's most easy to leave, uh, you can end up getting these very large structures. So a priori, you might be trying to make a new manufacturing process and be like, okay, I'm going to do reverse pulse plating. I'm just going to arbitrarily choose these deposition uh, settings, and I should get a smoother surface. If you do that, you can actually cause some damage to your system. Uh, the other thing that's interesting here is there's something akin to Oswald ripening where the largest one, because it's the hardest to etch uh, in time, ends up always taking more. So you can see that the number of particles, we'll call them, ends up decreasing as a function of time. Now there are three, and eventually one ends up consuming all of the, the mass in this particular case. So this was an interesting result that made for some nice compelling videos. Uh, but also has a, a real value in knowing that when you're designing a process, understanding the physics would help you choose parameters better. And you need to make sure that you're not causing damage when you think you're going to be helping what is happening. Right, so there's an elephant in the room that I have completely ignored. Uh, and that is the fact that we are shooting many, many electrons through our system. So we're shooting a very high amount of radiation through our liquid system, and I haven't addressed that at all. So now I'd like to do that. So remember I started out talking about gold nanoparticles and them aggregating? We were really excited to see that we had these particles aggregating. And now it's time to ask, why do these otherwise charged stabilized particles aggregate? And when all we've done is put them in our device and look at them under the electron beam. Well, consequently, we are, coincidentally, we are exposing our sample to a large amount of radiation in the form of the electron beam. And in order to properly interpret these results, we must have a good understanding of the, the beam sample interactions and what this means. So now we move into what's a field called radiation chemistry. So when you take ionizing radiation and you shoot it at water, uh, no matter what type of ionizing ra radiation, it doesn't have to be just electrons, it can be protons, it can be photons, it can be gamma rays, heavy particles. Uh, as the radiation passes through the system, you'll have energy deposition events where you can um, you can dislodge orbital electrons and end up having some highly reactive species that form. So in the very initial stages of an energy deposition event, you end up ejecting an electron. The electron will begin to interact uh, very quickly with the water around it, and you end up having what are called hydrated electrons. We call them hydrated electrons because it's water, uh, generally known as either aqueous electrons or solvated electrons. And these are just electrons that have a cage of water around them that are very reactive, but they haven't fully reacted with the system around them. The water ion then begins to react with the other water molecules around it, and we begin to break down the water into many different species. And in the very short times, the, uh, the distribution of these species in space is very inhomogeneous. But you can imagine, if you have an energy deposition event, this grows in, uh, due to reaction, reaction and diffusion uh, in a spherical shape. And we end up calling this a spur. And by the time you get to, say, 10 to negative 7 to 10 to negative 6 seconds, you end up having seven different primary species in the case of neat water. And uh, then if you want to go on to later time, what's really nice about this is these spurs is that we can model them with about 10 reactions in order to account for all the species that are created. If you want to go to longer times, however, uh, say the times that are important for us liquid cell electron microscopists of seconds, minutes, or hours, you have to begin to incorporate many slower reactions. And in our case, we end up using a, mo a model where we have 79 different kinetic reactions in order to account for the full chemical evolution of the system. So we have dozens of reactions that we have to account for if we want to fully understand the evolution of the chemistry in time. What's really nice, though, is that we can um, model, you take conservation of mass and model this with a transport equation, where we can say that the amount of crea uh, species created or destroyed uh, in, uh, over time is equal to the species that diffuse in or out of the system, plus any species that's created or destroyed due to reaction with the other species in the system. 
And then what we're going to do is we're going to cheat. So I talk, told you about this very inhomogeneous phase. So the spur is at about 10 to the negative 6 seconds. You can think of the distribution of the species as very homogeneous, as well mixed. So we're going to cheat a little bit, and instead of modeling the very inhomogeneous fast reactions, we're actually just going to replace them with a constant called the G value, uh, which radiation chemists uh, introduced. And this is just the measure of the number of molecules created or destroyed per 100 electron volts deposited uh, of energy deposited into the system. And so those seven species, we can just apply a source term at the end there, accounting for these very fast reactions. So now we have a system of 16 coupled uh, differential equations. I'm going to cheat one more time, and I'm going to assume that the whole world is irradiated. And so we're not going to worry about diffusion outside of the beam region. We'll come back to that in a minute. And so if you fully irradiate a system, you can solve those 16 now coupled o uh, ordinary differential equations very easily in any numerical solver. And so we did that, and I'm going to show a subset of those 16 species that are important to us liquid cell electron microscopists. So I'm going to show these, these six species, mainly the molecular species, species and the, highly, the most highly reactive uh, radical species. When you solve these equations, you end up getting a, what, um, what each of them do as a function of time. And we can see that very quickly at dose rates associated with, say, a standard TEM, where we have a one micron radius beam with one nanoamp of current. Uh, this gives us a dose rate of about 10 to the 7th, 10 to the 8th grace per second. We see that within a millisecond, we end up, all the species end up going flat, meaning they've reached a steady state. So this is a very interesting uh, consequence of this, that even though we have all these uh, reactions going on, the, the set is coupled such that you have forward reactions and reverse reactions, creating some of these molecular and radical species, and also recombining to create water to the point where you can reach a steady state under a constant dose rate. So what we can do is we can take and just change the dose rate, which is, again, just the measure of the amount of energy we're depositing in the system. And we do this for many dose rates, and we can get the steady state value as a function of dose rate. Now you might ask, Nick, why are you showing from 10 to the negative 2 grace per second to 10 to the 10th grace per second? Well, all of this that I've shown you with this radiation chemistry comes from, uh, it's a, a well-studied field and well-developed field for medical imaging, for nuclear uh, reactor studying. And so when you're, say you were to go and get an x-ray, you would be quoted with a dose rate of hundreds of grays per hour. So that's going to put you on the very left of this chart. If you were studying a nuclear reactor and you wanted to be safe, you would study up to, say, about 1,000 grays per second, so right in the middle. In the electron microscope, however, we are actually reaching dose rates that are much higher because our beam is over such a small area. The amount of energy we're depositing per unit mass is going to be in this 10 to the 6th to 10 to the 10th range. And if you're in a stem, then it'll be even more, uh, it'll be even higher. If you were to park a stem beam, you could reach up to, say, 10 to the 13th grace per second. So now we end up accessing, uh, our devices allow us to access a radiation dose rates that aren't available in other means. And this will, this will have consequences for the systems that we image. So now I want to tell you about, so most of the time we have, we don't irradiate the whole volume of the liquid cell, and we just irradiate a small area. So we'll have a fixed one micron uh, radius beam. And we want to understand what happens in these types of cases. Uh, so as an example of what happens spatially, I'm just going to show you two species. Hydrogen, which is a molecular species, is the most well-behaved, it's the least reactive. And the hydrated electron, which is the most reactive species. So the gray area here represents the irradiated volume. And then the lines increase as a function of time. So what you can see is that at a very short time, say uh, fractions of a millisecond, we've already reached the same order of magnitude as our final steady state value. The last line up here is the steady state. Um, but only inside the beam we're on the same order of magnitude, and outside of the beam it um, hasn't grown yet. So this is acting just as you would expect a heat equation to act if you have a source term, that you have to basically wait for diffusion to fill up the whole cell before the device can reach its final steady state. However, right in the beam region, you end up reaching... Um, high, relatively high levels, so you're still in the same order of magnitude of uh, your species that you're creating within the beam. Now, on the other hand, the hydrate electrons, the most reactive species, they actually act very non-montonically in time, where you can have a very high spike of them in the beam region in short times, but then it drops down to its final steady state value. Uh, you'll notice that, however, they only persist within the beam, and they do not exist too far outside of the edge of the beam. So this will be very important and a uh, for us to know that the radical species only exist in the irradiated volume, and this will have consequences for some of the uh, processes that we image. So now back to our initial question. Why do these otherwise charged stabilized particles aggregate? So now that we know that we're changing the solution chemistry significantly, you might think, well, there, there are probably two realistic hypotheses. 
One, you might be, um, you're creating many charged species, so you might be changing the, the Debye length, the Debye screening length. We can go through, we can do the calculation, and we find that the Debye length only decreases about, by about 10 or 15 percent. And so since these are a commercial product, um, we can expect that that's probably not the case that's causing them to aggregate. So it must be something else. So if we look at, oh, well, what is the pH inside the irradiated region? And we can see that for our dose rate in this particular example, and the fact that we started off with initial pH of 7, we're actually taking the pH from 7 and dropping it down to about 4.5. So this is a very large change in pH. And so what we're actually doing is we're changing the zeta potential, or the, the charge on the surface of, the, of these particles, and moving them closer to their isoelectric point. And it's most likely the reason why they're aggregating is because of this large change in pH. Even more important than just watching these nanoparticles aggregate, is for anyone who's doing, especially in electrochemistry, is no, you need to know that you can make your, you can be changing locally the pH of your system very significantly, especially if you're imaging in the more basic solutions. If you're in our copper solution where uh, our pH is two initially, we're actually not changing the pH too much. But if you're wor working in a system, say in KOH, uh, zinc and KOH, for example, you need to know that your local conditions are not your bulk conditions when you're using such a high radiation flux. So now that we have an understanding of the beam sample interactions, what other phenomena can we explain through radiolysis? One of the things that we saw very early on was the nucleation and growth of nanobubbles. Uh, so here we're seeing some bubbles that are growing at a very consistent rate. We argue that the consistent rate of them growing implies that there is some steady state going on. Uh, we don't know exactly what that is, and the dynamics of these bubbles is actually uh, pretty difficult to explain. Mike Norton's the one who's working on that problem. Uh, it ends up being very interesting, so you should talk to him about that. But uh, we want to understand better why are we forming these bubbles. They seem to be formed by the beam. So uh, another thing we can do to check that idea of is there actually a steady state is we can look at very large bubbles and how fast they grow. So if we plot the projected area as a function of time and switch our microscope parameters uh, so that we can change the, the dose rate, or in this case it was the, uh, the beam current which is directly related to the dose rate. We see that for a lower dose rate, they grow at some rate that is slower than one for a higher dose rate, implying that whatever is causing this bubble to form, uh, in this case it's molecular species, hydrogen, oxygen, is, going to, is being controlled directly by the beam. And so we know that the hydrogen and oxygen are going to be, that's being produced due to the radiolysis is what is going to be controlling uh, these, the nucleation growth of these bubbles. So when I talk about the nucleation of bubbles, we also, you need to know the pressure in order to know how much of a given species you need to saturate the solution. Uh, so in order to do that, we can actually use an intensity profile looking at the window. And this is the uh, really nice problem because here we have this window that is, say, a square and it's going to have some pressure due to the liquid inside and then the vacuum on the outside because of the microscope. And so we can look at the intensity gradient to get a measure of the bowing of the window, compare that to the beam bending problem that would, we would get for a thin silicon nitride membrane window, and we can actually estimate the pressure. What's really interesting is our devices are sealed with O-rings, so we have a completely closed system, and we actually get pressures that are much lower than Still in the same order of magnitude, but much lower than atmosphere. So we loaded these devices at atmospheric pressure, put them in the microscope, allowed the windows to bulge, and the pressure actually dropped. And we see that before the bubble nucleates, we have a pressure of, say, about a seventh of an atmosphere. And after the bubble nucleates, it goes up to one half. So this is consistent with the fact that now that we introduce the second vapor phase, the windows bow more, and so the pressure increases. So that makes sense. Now for the nucleation of the, the bubbles, we can look at that spatial radiolysis simulation where we're only irradiating a small portion of the liquid cell because our liquid cell is actually much larger. And we can look at the evolution of hydrogen, say at the center of the beam, the edge of the beam, and the wall. And the center of the beam grows the quickest, the edge of the beam uh, is very close to it, and the wall has to wait for diffusion to catch up before the wall ever sees any of the hydrogen. And this leads to an interesting consequence that you can actually have a region where even though your steady state value might be high enough to nucleate bubble growth, you can have prolonged imaging that's a function of the size of your device where you have no bubble growth. And so in this case, we were able to induce a bubble because we had such a high dose rate that our supersaturation of hydrogen uh, was high enough in order to create a bubble. But most people, because their pressure is much higher, is closer to an atmosphere in the commercial cells, since they have direct connection outside the microscope, uh, they might not necessarily see bubbles in a pure water system like we were able to.
Um, yes. So now I talked a little bit about the molecular species and how we can create some bubble nucleation and growth. What about the highly reactive species? They're, they might be a little bit uh, more interesting. So one time we were looking at gold nanoparticles provided by the Murray group here at Penn, and they were gold nanorods, and we wanted to image them aggregating like we saw the spheres. However, we noticed that when we shot the beam at them, we actually began to etch the particles. And this is something that we, we wanted to understand. And so what we can do is we can look, go through and change the microscope parameters so we can change the dose rate and see what happens. And we saw that at some dose rates, the particles etched. At, then at a slightly higher dose rate, they actually remained stable and there was no growing or etching. And then for the very high dose rates, we ended up having growth. So the reason this would happen is because we have both oxidizing and reducing species. We have species that want to cause the particles to etch, along with species that want to cause the particles to grow. And it's a little bit more complicated in this particular case because the <coughs> particles have CTAB on them, uh, which is a polymer that has a bromine ion, and bromine, is known, bromine and its radicals are known to etch gold. But I'm going to simplify it just to what's in the water and look at the, the mainly the most, re, um, most reducing and oxidizing species. So the hydrated um, electron, well, really wants to react with the gold ions there in solution, causing them to be reduced to solid gold. And the OH radicals want to oxidize them, put them back into ions in solution. And when we plot the ratio of these as a function of dose rate, we can see that there's a non-monotonic relationship, supporting the idea that there can actually be some dose rate where the particles remain relatively stable because the etching, uh, the etching rate and the growth rate are equal in that case, while still having it sandwiched between both of these other regimes. So this is something that we can use the beam, take advantage of the beam in order to control what regime we're in. If you want to understand the dynamics of the particles aggregating, you want to be in the center. If you want to create new particles, new geometries, then you want to be on either side of that. Um, when I talk about the hydrate electrons, I noted that they were highly isolated in the beam region, and we know that if we have a high enough dose rate, we can grow particles, so we can actually begin to exploit this as a manufacturing process, and we were able to do that. Joe took a very long time to uh, do some writing. In science, there's a law that when you can write, you always write your institution names. And so Joe wrote Penn IBM. By controlling the zoom in the microscope, which in this case controls the dose rate and the, the way that we have the stem set up, he was able to zoom in at all these points and actually selectively grow these, what, uh, these in this case they're microwires, but you can also do this to create nanowires. And this is something that can be exploited as a manufacturing process on devices where you can use the electron beam in these liquid systems in order to create controlled geometries. So, uh, at this point I'd like to first uh, do some more thanks. I originally thank the people who helped me scientifically, but a PhD is more than just what happens in the lab. Uh, so I do, of course, want to thank my mentors, Joe, Francis, and Dr. Bao, uh, my committee members, Dr. Strolovitz and Dr. Gianola, uh, my collaborators here and elsewhere. I've been very lucky to be able to work with many undergraduate students in the time here, and they all contributed to this work in a, a meaningful way. The Penn community has, has been a great place, both the Bao and the Who groups, the Mean department, the students, faculty, uh, and staff. Uh, memers from the classes that I TA, that was one of the most enjoyable parts of my uh, my time here was being able to TA. I TA'd for my advisor, but also Dr. Karpik and Dr. Chidi, which they were great examples of teachers for me. Uh, and I'd be amiss at not mentioning my, my Rodin uh, people, both the students, the residents, and uh, the ragas, many of whom uh, are showing up today, so I appreciate that very much. And there are many others at RIT, my parents. I'm very lucky to have all four of my grandparents still in life. Um, my, my aunt, me, and her family, they often take me in to be a part of their immediate family for holidays since it's, it's much, it's, uh, yeah, uh, the RT community <laughs> and many people that have, have helped me along, along the way. Since this is a PhD presentation, I'm supposed to show the output of this work. We have some published journal part, papers, a book chapter, and a couple more papers to come. So with that, today I've shown you a little bit about how we can use liquid cell electron microscopy to study some very interesting systems, such as copper electron deposition. I showed you that we can understand better uh, the quantitatively what is happening with the electron beam when you're using it as an imaging device. And you can use you exploit these processes in order to do manufacturing with the beam itself. With that, I'd like to take any questions.